languages, but that stresses program out. <laughs> <laughs> so stress we'll test. Stress, stress test. test. <laughs> We're really putting you on the spot here, teaching us all all we need to know about C C or C plus plus and its integration with R and everything. So I, I gotta say that it's actually pretty cool. I mean, if you had to, if you wanted to learn C plus plus, if you and you knew R already. That gives you like kind of an advantage because you can use this RCP thing. Um, where's the right window? There is RCP, RCPP to give you an easy interface into uh, C from R. And that's much easier than, let's say, using the command line or something like that. You yeah, can expedite your C learning. The only downside, I think, is that at least by default, it doesn't have like the most modern C. There's something at the end, I forgot, like there's a way to like install some additional thing to and or enable a more modern C, but it's only a minor annoyance. And it doesn't matter at all for the main purpose of doing this, right? All right, so you can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so the objectives here just to learn. So in the past chapters, we've learned how to measure performance and we learned some ways within R to improve performance. But hey, what happens when you know none of these things work and you just got to get down to the metal and, and implement your uh, the inner loop, the tight inner loop uh, in machine in C++, right? Or in C, which essentially means doing it in machine code because it's going to get compiled directly to machine code and be lightning fast, right? The only way you can make it faster, you can figure out some way to get it onto this GPU. <laughs> and that's way out of scope, but yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the point of this chapter. Um, so we're gonna learn how to rewrite some R code into C++ to make it faster using the RCPP package. And it really does make it easy to connect your uh, uh, C++ to R. Um, so you can do things like take loops that you can't vectorize, Put them right into C plus plus, and they'll be fast as they can be. Uh, we, he doesn't really talk much about this, but one of the kind of nice thing about C plus, you can you can do recursive functions in there, which involve many many deep calls. In R, there's the, the call stack or the call overhead is pretty high. In C plus plus, it's about as minimal as you can get, so you can have deep recursion without having that slowdown. And you also get access to the standard template library, which can you might need for some kind of advanced algorithms. Not only that, though, you can also get access to other C++ things that are out there. He doesn't mention that too much, but like, for example, in the early days, I'm just a kind of example. In the early days, um, maybe you wanted to, maybe you're an early adopter of Torch and you wanted to get access to that. Well, Torch has a C++ API, which you could potentially reach directly into uh, from R using this package. Now, that's not, you don't need to do that because there is already a, uh, excuse me, an R Torch. <laughs> Uh, that does exactly that. It reaches into the C++, doesn't go through Python, just goes directly to the C++, which is nice. So those are uh, the advantages uh, and why you might want to look at using C++. So again, just to be clear, optimizations and possibly reaching into uh, other libraries that are out there that are only, uh, that are kind of new and haven't been ported over to R yet. Okay, so first thing uh, you need to have, well, you need to have this library RCPP installed. Uh, but more importantly, you got to have a C++ compiler installed in your computer for this to work. So it depends on what you're on. On Windows, you can use R tools. Um, on Mac, you can use Xcode. And uh, for Linux, you can you know install the developer stuff. You probably already have the developer package because a lot of the packages need this anyway because they're doing some compiling behind the scenes. But it works for me. I didn't have to do any extra steps on my Windows machine or my Mac machine. So apparently, I'd already installed whatever it was was necessary. Uh, and I, if you guys, I assume you, you guys have gone through this chapter and, and tried these things out because it's actually, it's hard to express in like a chart like this, how pretty amazing it is. You can just type CPP function and then put in here some just C++ code and it will compile it, run it, and then you can call it and it'll just work. So I hope you guys all tried that. Have you? Have you guys all loaded up your computer? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I thought it was like a great interface, like, well, just not that it's like the CPP function, but like the, when you sourced it, like, I thought that was really cool because when you try to source yeah, we'll it, get, if yeah. You, yeah, when we get there, I thought there were some really, really cool features of that, but yeah, when we get there, I'll kind of point those yeah. out that I found to be interesting. Yeah, especially in comparison to like the C interface, because in the first edition, they go through like the C interface and that. It's a huge pain in the butt where you have to like 
jail yeah. it separately and then like write a wrapper function right and the then, wrappers oh man it was so that painful. was this that was the standard way of doing things python still supports that wrapper uh, methodology as well in their python api c api but probably no one uses it because now there's cython which is sort of a similar idea to rcpp but actually i mean it goes one step further and you hardly ever have to write any c code because you can just it'll compile python code to machine language for you which is pretty nice so that would be the next iter next generation of rcp was like here's my r code you do the translation actually maybe just get chat gpt hey translate this r code into c plus plus stick it into a file and you have to you, you probably get a, lo a long uh, get a lot of distance out of that right it's, like, it's a compiler but it's just chat gpt <laughs> <laughs> yeah just just cut the whole thing out. Just chat gpt give me the answer to this thing so i can send it to my supervisor now but <laughs> But yeah, no, you can it'll you can it'll spit out the C plus plus code. You could potentially just stick it in, one, in a C plus plus file and add the the appropriate little R thingies, which we'll get to in a minute. Anyway, I thought that was pretty amazing. Uh, just some things to point out: if you don't know C plus plus, you're not going to really learn it from this chapter. But a lot of things are similar to R. Some of the differences are, for example, when you define a function. Well, first of all, you define a function differently. You don't use an assignment. It looks more like you're calling a function. That's how you define functions in. Um, C like languages and Java, many languages are work this way. So it's not, you'll probably run into it over and over again. And the other thing is you have to explicitly declare the types. And for every like scalar type in R, there's a corresponding type in uh, C++, C world. So int is one, double for numericals. Uh, bool is your logical and string, which is actually, the string that they use is actually a special string for RCPP, but it's a, it's a C side. Huh, C side. Anyway, it's a C side. I don't have any way to say it now. <laughs> other world use these types on our side, use the other, the built in R types. And it does a lot of automatic transformation between these types. So you don't have to worry about it. RCPP does. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. So I'm down here. I have some notes about this. Every statement has to be ter terminated with a semicolon. You use equals for an assignment, just like every other language in the world, except for R, which uses this thing. That, I don't know if that's really true, but it seems like it. <laughs> it seems like almost every other language in the world. Um, yeah, and types have to be, oh, and so they're in the vector types in RCP become integer vector, numeric vector, logical vector, and character vector. And these are RCPP types, not, you know, not uh, other, you know, C++ programs you run into the way I won't use this. It's only for when you're interfacing with R, that's what I'm trying to say. And they also support like list, Function, data frame, these are again R types for how they look in the C side. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview of that. Uh, he gives a couple examples now in the book. He gives an example with a scalar input and scalar output. That's pretty straightforward. Um, here's an R function that just returns the sign written out about as verbose as you could possibly write it out, but just to make, make the point, right? Um, and you, you can translate this kind of verbose form almost directly into C++, and it looks almost the same. This part looks the same, except for the semicolons, and you have to do the explicit returns. But the if syntax is identical, right? Um, and you have to you know, give the explicit types. But here I'm using the C++ native type int instead of, you want to say nothing, but, um, and so when you pass in an integer, it will, from R, it'll automatically translate it into the C++ world int. Int is a native type, it's not special to, um, int double bool are native types, they're not, special to RCPP, Just point that out. So what he says in the book is not everything is different. Many things are similar because R probably copied uh, a lot of that syntax from C would be my guess. Uh, then he gives another example. If you have a vector input, but a scalar output like summing, okay, here's the R version and doing it in a very explicit loop just to show the purpose of doing that is just to show how these things look in, uh, in C++. Um, so C++ is, is similar. So here we have to use a type again. We have to ex explicitly declare types of all our inputs and outputs in C++ and any variables too. So the type corresponding to a vector in R becomes a numeric vector in C++. Uh, we then are gonna calculate the size of it. We're gonna need the size. So we, again, we're gonna declare, it's called a declaration in C++, a new variable in C as well uh, called N and assign it to the size of X. So this is a method call. And this is how methods calls look in C++, C, Java, uh, Python. 
it's, it's relatively standard, but it's not the way it looks in art. So it's something new potentially to you. The dot has meaning. And this, by the way, is one of the things that when I first started learning R, uh, threw me off so many times because in R, they off, people often use the dot where you might use an underscore in other languages, just to make a longer variable name. I'm like, well, what is this method call you're doing here? <laughs> it's like, oh, there's no method call. Oh, and also for the, uh, for the S3 methods, right? That dot is used there too, so. Uh, okay, so, and then we declare another variable, total assigned to zero, and then this loop does look different. It uses this syntax uh, for the for loop. The book goes into detail what this means, but you can, you can understand what it's saying. It's saying, okay, start at zero. Uh, as long as I is less than N, do this loop, and every time at the end of the loop, add one to I. So you, it's kind of explicit how you have to construct the loops in, uh, well, in older C++, modern C++ has this ranged uh, for, which can looks, looks a lot more like the R version where you can just say for I in some range. I think he talks about, look, he doesn't have an example here, but uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. I think I talked about everything in this little list here. Oh, and this is another common thing in many C-like languages, this, which I wish R had, I don't know why it doesn't have this, this nice little increment uh, operator, you know, plus equals, it's, it's a uh, very common in, in every other language. <laughs> it just means this is a little shorthand. That's all. And uh, it's called the in-place operator. The other ones are minus equal, times equal, and divided equal. Just be aware of that. Okay, so that's the translation. Which one's faster? So he's going to compare the built-in sum, the C sum, and the R sum. Uh, and you can see that the uh, the built-in sum is actually uh, well. And the minimum side anyway, just slightly faster. I guess it's yeah, it's slightly faster, right? Than the C, but it's really it's almost you know this is probably within the measurement noise, right? The the built-in is not doing much anything different than we just did in in C. Whereas clearly the R version with the explicit loop is much 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 slower, orders of magnitude slower. So it's nice. Very easily you can get you know if you have some obviously you're not going to use it for some, but you had some other thing that was like how to loop it. You can't figure out for the life of you. You know what? Sometimes it's much faster. I think maybe to What's, what's the right approach sometimes like to vectorize, right? Well, you can't figure out how to vectorize it. Maybe there's some trick. I mean, you, how tricky do you want to be anyway, right? At some point, um, at some point, you, if you can't live with the slowdown, you might have to uh, reach into some native code to make this work. Yeah, I would say that even though the minimums are similar, if you look at iterations per second, the built-in is twice, um, basically twice. Twice as fast, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's a better column to look at. So twice is nothing, right? You know, nobody cares about factors of two. <laughs> so usually, you know, you want factors of 10 or something. Okay, uh, this next example is for vector input and output. And the thing here is you have to explicitly construct the output vector by declaring it here. So we're gonna declare what this does is construct an object of type numeric vector. And this argument here is for the constructor tells it how big it should be. And this is just one of those things you just have to learn how to do in, in, when you, in C++ or in many of these types of languages. You have to tell, you have to pass some arguments to the constructor. And then we're just going to fill it in. Fill it in with this little loop. Uh, let's see. One of the things he points out is there's no, you know, the caret operator does not give you uh, exponentiation in C or C++ languages. So you have to use this explicit pow function. Or in this case, you could just multiply the thing by itself or something. But um, that's... That's that. Uh, was there any other? Point? No, I guess that's the main things to point out there. You can compare the R version to the C version here. Um, there's not much difference, it turns out, but <laughs> in speed for that particular case. So, Ron, I got a question for you. Because this is vectorized. Uh, yeah. That's why this is already vectorized. That's why that's so fast. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I got it. So, since you're the C programming expert here, expert is well, <laughs> more of an expert than I am. Um, is the reason why we have to be explicit in C a function of like memory management? Is that like what it is? Or I don't know. I'm having what do you a mean? Bit. So, like, you know, like when you, so like this, like, do you, yeah, well, I mean, like when you have to do like the int call or the numeric vector call before you like create a variable or, you know, before you create an object or something like that, is that because you're just like, like, is that because of like C++ you have more control over like memory management? Oh, yes. That, I mean, that is what's happening. That's correct. Yeah. So here, 
when you construct this object, it's being constructed in memory, a place is being put aside for right here at this spot. And you have to do it explicitly. Um, and if uh, now RCP takes care of some of the stuff behind the scenes, otherwise, when this thing went out of scope, it would actually free that memory, but RCP grabs this numeric vector as it comes out um, and it makes it available to R. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, you do have yeah, to explain Yeah. Because because I remember I remember reading like just like digging around like are you know if you're using C plus plus you're able to have more control over memory allocation for the objects that you I mean, create. It's not just able to you do have to have you, you have, have it. To, yeah, you have to manage it, and that's you know one of the, there's a lot of tools in C plus plus that beyond the scope of this, but that you use for that like smart pointers and uh, things like that to manage your memory, and it's actually oh, like okay. one of the biggest headaches for. To me, anyway, if when doing C plus plus program in a in a in a large, you make big programs, keeping track of all this memory is pain. Because you don't have like a because there's no garbage collector. No garbage collector. So yeah, so like I mean, I remember I did this uh, C plus plus plugin uh, for like a compressor, and a lot of the time I spent like worried about keeping track of parameters and you know allocating pools of them and because you know when person changes the control i gotta keep track of that somewhere i'm not ready to act on it so i gotta save them somewhere in some big stack and then deal with them and then get rid of them and delete them i mean hmm. <laughs> there's there's a lot of conveniences for some yeah level language. well that's why these languages about. exist because you don't want to have to think about that when you're doing a you know do a data analysis yeah hmm. another thing is um if you have the types another thing is it's called like statically types. So the types don't change. So in R, right. you can have N be a string and then all of a sudden change it to 10. Um, and that basically lets the compiler like do assumptions about your data, like your program that makes, that's part of one of the reasons why it's fast is it doesn't have to like have to see what type your thing is. It just knows right. what it is. Yeah, it knows, the, that's a good point. The compiler sets aside exactly the amount of space it needs, like an integer, for example, and it knows it's an integer and that's it. It doesn't know because it tagged it somehow. It's compiled into the code that every time it accesses that, it accesses it as an integer. Whereas every object in R probably has to have like some sort of tag with it, what type it is now, <laughs> right? Yeah, because there's like statically typed garbage yeah. collected languages, like I think Go is. And one of the reasons why Go is so fast is because it is, statically typed i think right. or like typescript for example now, in modern c++ it, in like c++ 11 and, and further on they've done a lot to help alleviate some of this um with type inference of some kinds they can use auto you can have an auto type an auto keyword it'll figure out what the type has to be and, and do that for you that kind of thing but but they still have a static type they don't change okay so that's that um now that was some quick examples as uh, Colin mentioned before, using this function uh, that we've been using, what the heck was it called? <laughs> C++ function is fine for experimentation, but for bigger things, you're probably gonna wanna put things into their own files. And C++ files have this extension C++, that's the convention that's uh, been around for a long time. And, and all you have to do is include this RCP P in the top and use this namespace, uh, Namespace sort of like using, so including here tells the program uh, what the types of, basically what it is, it has to be the types again, right? So this is a bunch of header files that tells it what types things are and gives you access to, uh, gives the linker access to all these functions you're gonna call from RCPP. And the namespace part is more like the library thing in R, which allows you to call, uh, it really is very similar, right? Without this namespace thing, you'd have to type RCPP colon colon whatever, just like you do in R, you know? Like I do per colon colon blah blah. It's the same kind of thing. This is a, allows you to pull that in. We don't have to to use that anymore. Uh, this is a special thing that this a, this right here just is a comment in C plus plus, but this comment has special meaning to uh, to the RCPP system to tell that this is a function you want to export for use in R. Okay, and then finally, this is also another way of writing a comment with this uh, slash star star slash. But this is another special. If you put R here, then the uh, RCPP will execute the R code you put in there, which is kind of cool. So this is just an example right here. Um, I, in R Markdown, I put engine RCPP in here. It's a shorthand for what the text says, engine equals CPP, just put RCPP. You can't see it in here. Um, Cause it's not, I don't show you the actual thing. But um, if you do that in your Markdown, you can just include that C++ code just like this, just like I have right here. Instead of saying, you know, 
tick, 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 R, you say tick, 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 RCPP. That's, and everything else is the same, just stick it in there. Um, and then this comment will get executed if you're in the, um, if you do it interactively in the R Studio, if you click the little arrow button and interactively do it. But for some reason, um, it won't, knit won't, knit will run it. When you run knit, you'll see it pop out on your console, but it won't, it won't paste it in here, the output. So I just had to repeat it here. Does that make sense? Should I show you that? That clears mud. That's that's interesting that knitter won't like if you knit your your markdown file, it won't actually. That's interesting. Hmm. It's probably some option I don't know about. Like maybe you're supposed to put like something else in the block thing. Like I tried a couple of things, but they didn't work. But um, hmm. it'll it'll run it because like I said, it pops up down here in the it pops up down the key. Let's see what I'm pointing at. It pops out in the console. So I don't know. Uh, anyway. You can, I can just include it in a separate R block because once I run this, this function mean C has now been exported in R. So once I run this, it's now a function inside my R system, this mean C, right? Um, and so I can just run it like, oh, okay, do a benchmark on this again, mean, built in mean, and a C mean. And yeah, the C mean is slower, but it's not terribly slower. I should have compared it to the R mean, but this is what it is. But oh, I'm sorry, it's actually. Way, way faster. Why is that? It's probably due to type checking and looking for NAs and stuff. Ah, you're right. That's probably what it is. You're right. I think he does mention that in the book. At first, I was reading it backwards. Like, wait, this is way faster. Uh, well, not way faster. It's still like factor, what, two, two and a half or something like that. Yeah, or I think three, I remember factor saying, three. reading somewhere, the C version of mean, even in um, for the R, the built-in version, in like, does two passes over the right. array for That's numerical something reasons. And also, so, yeah. like I said, probably something to do with NA, so. Oh yeah, for sure. So factor of three, ah, it's probably, you know, it's plenty fast, right? But the point of this was the, the C version is, you know, again, you would never do this for the mean function, probably, unless that factor three you know, really would make a difference uh, for your particular application. And even then, there might be some options you could pass to me and to uh, get it to do less checking or less passes or something. I don't know, to, this, to the R mean version. Okay, so next section is to talk about uh, other types. There's so other types can also be looked at from the C++ side, so lists and data frames. Uh, in the book, he says lists and data frames, but he just uses this list type because I guess a data frame is a list, right? So he, this, this example in the book, he passes in a model uh, from LM. So here, you know, just LM using the empty cards built in data set. Um, and so he, in the C++, he makes the point of saying, okay, I wanna make sure this really is LM because I'm gonna just immediately cast these things into numeric vectors. Uh, but it's cool, you can actually, you, you get this uh, list in the C++, you can pretty much use this uh, notation is very similar to what you might do in uh, in R to get at the residuals, to get at the fitted values. The only problem is that at, when they come out here, I think they must be like R object type or something like that. I don't know, because it doesn't know what type they are. So you do a cast. That's what this is right here. This is not a, um, it's similar to a C++ native cast, but it's clearly a RCPP cast with this as thing. Whenever you see some of the angle brackets like this with a type, which you'll see a lot in C++, that means I'm telling the C++ compiler that I want the particular version of the as function that works for numeric vectors. It's called a template argument. And you'll see those a lot in, uh, in actually today, you'll see that a few more times. But whenever you have something that could be potentially more than one type uh, in C++, those kind of generics are handled by template arguments, which are given in angle brackets before the actual function call. So it's kind of like this, this function takes two types. It takes a type and then whatever you're operating on, you can think of it that way. But. So anyway, what was the point of this whole thing? Um, the point I was just to illustrate how you get at uh, parts of a, of, a, of a list. Functions can be passed in too. This is you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, this, this Again, this is not a native C++ type, but rather a RCPP type, RCPP, that's hard to, Say somehow. Anyway, these you to say. Uh, and here, all, all this function does is just call it with one. That's what it says it does, and you can test it, and it does work. Okay, great, right? And other values can be accessed. Uh, environments, all the things we know and love can be 
accessed from uh, C++, but you probably won't have to, hopefully won't have to do too much of that because kind of what you're going to probably end up doing if you're doing this at all is passing in numeric vectors and then doing a loop with them of some kind that you can't figure out how to vectorize. <laughs> That's going to be your main application, I would think. Uh, this section right here, I'm just going to breeze through, but he talks a little bit about how NAs are a little bit different. The main problem is that the native types, int, bool, uh, uh, double doesn't have a concept. Well, double does. Int and bool, for example, don't have a concept in C++ of NA or missing valueness. Bool can only be two values, true or false. So there's no room for a, for an NA in there. It turns out the uh, doubles are the you know triple triple I triple E standard does include the NAND concept, so those are represented in there. But they do act a little bit differently in logical expressions, so something to be aware of. You'd be careful about. I don't want to belabor the point. Um, just be aware that NAs you might have to treat specially. One way around this, one almost perfectly universal workaround for this is always use vectors because the vectors are RCPP types and they know how to handle um, NAs. But if you pass in scalars, you probably want to make some special uh, condition checking before you do anything else. Uh, so this is just a quick example. I don't think it's worth belaboring that point. Now to the standard template library. The standard template library is the C++ kind of native uh, library, similar to like the R standard library. It has all the in core C++, it's only like adding real numbers and everything else. Whereas the standard template library adds on lists and vectors and sets and um, and algorithms and all kinds of other things you can use in any in any C++ compiler that supports the standard template library, which is all of them. Uh, one quick point is this thing called an iterator. You will run into those all the time when you're using stuff from the standard template library because that's the standard interface, mostly. There's a newer interface called ranges, which is uh, kind of, I now wish I didn't mention, but anyway, if you run into ranges, that's a newer feature from the newer versions of C++. Iterators though is the old standby. Uh, what an iterator is, it's an object. And you can, when you have one of these things, it, it abstracts away a certain position, a certain pointer to a position inside a container of some kind, right? It's meant to be very abstract. What the container is, it could be anything, right? It could, what kind of uh, kind of values are there? Well, it depends on the type of the particular iterator, right? So, and they all support these operations of either you get the value of an iterator by using this star, which is called the dereferencing operator in uh, C++ C world. Uh, you can advance the iterator if it supports advancing with uh, plus plus by just adding one to it. It doesn't really add one, it actually increments the next memory address. And you can compare iterators, locations, not the values that are at the, at the thing by just using equals, right? To see if you've got some, you know, that's useful. Like, oh, this is the point of this part of the structure. Here's another point. Is that the same part? Well, why do I care about that? We'll see in a second. Uh, when I'm looping through a container, though, I want to know if I'm at the end or not. Uh, so uh, the real power of these things come from using with the S standard template library algorithms. And I give a pointer here to this reference. Uh, the c++reference.com is a great website. If you type in C++ reference, it might take you to another website, which is not so great. Lots of ads. This one's the one to go to. <laughs> um, just be aware of that. Uh, so the book gives a couple examples using accumulated upper bound using these algorithms. I'm just going to give another example here. Uh, two, I'm going I'm to do this two different ways, one with explicit iterators, and secondly, using an uh, algorithm. So all this function does is takes a uh, vector and squares every element of it, right? There's no reason why you might want to do it, but just something something to do, I guess. Um, so we can do this with explicit iterators. Now you wouldn't have to use explicit iterators here. I'm just doing this to demonstrate how iterators work. You could do this very simply without the iterators, okay? But the way this works is if I want to, I, if I have a, here I have an input object X, I'm gonna then I create an output object out of the same size. Okay, now I have these two objects. I want to get an iterator for both of them. So first I have to declare two iterators, their type, and every type has associated with it their own iterator. And you get that using the scope operator here, which you're familiar with from R, but uh, this right here is a type, numeric iterator, iterator is a type that's specific to numeric vectors. And there's one for every other type in, in, in C++ that, has, that is a container of some kind. So once I have those iterators, they're empty. These are, just, I just declared the variables. I haven't put anything in them yet. I'll put something in them in this for loop. So I'm gonna say, okay, the in iterator is gonna start at the, so you get you get at an iterator to my object 
x, the input vector, by using the begin. That gives me an iterator to the beginning of the structure. And I'm going to do that with my out as well. And then finally, I also need to get an iterator to the end of the input vector x. So I use x dot n to get that. Okay. Uh, and then I'm out. So what does this do? This says, okay, start the input into iterator at the beginning, start the output iterator at its own beginning, check on each iteration whether I've reached the end or not by comparing the input iterator to the ending iterator. And then at the end of each iteration, uh, increment the both iterators. So that's a lot, right? And in the, inside the loop, I'm just doing the simple calculation, dereferencing the input, squaring it, and add it in, assigning it to the output array and then returning it. That's a big mess, but that's how you would do with it. <laughs> uh, now, it turns out that I don't need to do that because I can, there's something called transform, there's an algorithm called transform in the algorithms library, which is um, similar to a map in R, okay? In fact, it's almost exactly the same as a map. So I can use that instead. So here again, I just, here's my square C, uh, take a numeric vector, declare the output vector, and then I'm just gonna use standard transform here. Again, I, need to, I tell it, this is where the iterators come in. Now I have to use iterators. Before I was, I was just using iterators as an example. You would never write that loop that way. Uh, but here I have to, because that's how the transforms work. So I tell it, it needs to know the beginning of the input, the beginning the ending of the, it needs to know the ending, but it's something important. C++ uh, vectors don't know where their ends are. <laughs> All right. By, or it, right, you have to, I mean, they do, I'm sorry. C++ arrays don't know where their ends are, but these vectors do, but you still have to get that information back out of it with this X dot end thing. So the transform takes three arguments, or sorry, four arguments. It takes uh, the beginning of the input, iterator and iterate to the end of the input and the iterate to the beginning of the output. It doesn't need to iterate to the, out, you know, the, yeah, the end of the output because you you're responsible for making sure it's big enough. And if it's not, it will just crash, okay? <laughs> it will not help you in any way, all right? And then finally, the last argument is the function to call. And here I just, for fun, I put in, I used a uh, C++ Lambda, uh, which is just an anonymous function similar to how you would do it in R. This is just a notation for doing that in C++. So I'm going to say, okay, this is a function that takes a double. This funny bracket here just tells it it's an anonymous function. Uh, you can put stuff in there. You can put, um, you can capture variables in there. That's beyond the scope of this. But when you don't capture any variables, it's empty brackets. And I'm you know, taking a, a double value, returning a double value. And here's the function to compute to square. And I did the squaring here just v times v, right? I could have defined a separate double function, but um, I was kind of, I should have done that because you probably don't need to know about this, but <laughs> it's a thing. It's actually not, it's a very common. Actually, I'm glad I did put this in here. I'm going to backpedal on that because you will, looking at any examples that use standard template library algorithms, you will see these anonymous functions, you these lambdas are called in C++ all the time. Uh, anyway, I didn't do the, I just just verified that it works, right? So here's the, the two squares work. I didn't do the um, benchmarking on this. It's one, the main point is just to show you how this, these iterators and how to use, how you could use the standard template library. I don't see um, algorithms. This is to me kind of advanced for somebody that just wants to speed up a loop that's in R. You probably won't need to do that, but you know what? It's actually maybe, you know, it's, it's not a bad skill to learn how to work the, uh, the C++ and standard template library like that. Okay, so this, um, whoop, what happened here? Did I skip a slide? These got out of order somehow? Oh no, they did not. All right, so the standard template also, standard template library also includes a large set of their own data structures. These are part of C++, these are native to the standard template library in C++. Uh, and, but fortunately, the RCPP knows how to convert a lot of these automatically to and from R types, which is convenient, especially if you're using somebody else's C++ code that you need to interface to. Uh, these things include standard vector, which is just like an R vector, right? Except that it knows how to grow efficiently by using this pushback thing. Um, standard or unordered set now is a, it's just a unique set of values. There's also an ordered version called standard set, but it's a little bit less efficient. efficient. Uh, so almost everybody just uses a standard unordered set, even though it's a mouthful. <laughs> it's like, oh, I just want a set. No, you want an unordered set. Okay, fine. So <laughs> for a map, there's also an unordered map, but here it doesn't matter as much. Um, I think people generally just use standard map. And map is just like our list in many ways, right? It's an association between uh, keys and values. So he gives a quick example using map. Uh, he gives other examples. I just want to, just as an example, 
to highlight a few things you might see if you ever get into using uh, the standard template library data structures. Um, so when I declare a function, this is a function that's going to take a, um, a vector and it's going to create a table that counts the number of occurrences of each number in that um, vector, right? So if the vector was two, two, one, I would get, you know, there's, oh, there's a two, there's two twos and there's one one, that type of thing. And that type is this standard type, standard map. And here's an angle bracket thing too. I have to tell it explicitly the type of this map. The keys are of type double, the values are of type int. And then I have to do it again. This is how C can be. It can be a little bit verbose, right? <laughs> I have to tell it again. Okay, here I need to, I need a place to put them. Here is my uh, output dictionary, or sorry, uh, map, right? Python dictionary, <laughs> I was thinking of. Um, here's my output map. Um, so this part is pretty straightforward. It's going to make a, a little for loop, go through and look up the value inside my map, and then if it and then add one to it. And it knows if there's nothing, it'll add a new uh, value to the, to, the, to the map. That's how C++ maps work. And I can return counts. And yeah, it works like one, one, two, one, four. So yeah, there's three ones. Uh, there's one, two, one, four, one, five. Again, just an illustration of how that the, some of the standard template library things work. It's, it's not terribly complicated. My, if you have a need for this, it's probably worth investigating on C++ reference and looking at the examples and how to do it. Because now you don't see a whole lot of boilerplate. I mean, boilerplate here. It's fairly straightforward. But anyway, C++ reference. There's a whole section on containers there about how to use these things. All right, now the case study. You like case studies? <laughs> What's a case study? I want one. So these are a couple of real life uses. Uh, one of them he illustrates is this Gibbs sampler. You know, Gibbs sampler, just instead of sampling the joint probability distribution all at once, you just kind of sample uh, you know, each part, each factor, and then leave all the others constant, and then you know, iterate through that in a nutshell. Uh, so this is from some blog entry you could read, but the original R code looks like this. It just goes through and, and you know, calls these uh, random deviant functions, right? Uh, and it fills in this matrix, but and he shows how to convert this to C++. So he says, look, all I got to do is take add all the type declarations where I need them. Uh, I need to use uh, parentheses instead of brackets to index, in, index into the matrix, okay? Um, and then subscript the results, uh, the random call to convert them from a vector to a scalar, right? Because I want to get a vector back from these R gamma and R norm, I need to convert it back to a, a scalar. Apparently that's necessary. Uh, and so that's, this is the C++ code. It doesn't look that dramatically different from the R code, right? It's something you can potentially uh, figure out how to do, which I think is pretty cool. One thing he doesn't call out, but I thought was interesting is where's this R gamma and this R norm defined? Well, it turns out, <laughs> The RCPP does export a large number of R functions in so they are available from within C++. And you can export your own functions to uh, R to C++ as well from R. So if you, if you, you, know, you, can, you can obviously pass in an R function as an argument, but you can also just make it generally available to the RCPP environment uh, for your code. I don't have an example of that because I just, I just learned about that like yesterday. <laughs> So we can check, uh, again, he does a, a quick um, uh, comparison and this is like hundreds of times, you know, not hundreds of times faster, right? Or is it more than hundred times faster? It's, it's a lot faster. I can't do math, but 10 times faster, I guess. That was like hundred times faster. 10 times faster, that's huge, right? That's, that's worth, uh, worth doing. Also, it's interesting that it uses a lot less memory because <laughs> it doesn't need to store all these intermediate values and hang on to them. And the last case study he does um, is predicting uh, a model response. So this is some kind of model and like you just need to, we need to call this over and over and over again, this, this, this function. And if we have to call this in a loop, um, it's gonna be really slow, right? But we can vectorize it, okay? So this, is, takes, this takes the whole function right here, just vectorize so it can work on vectors rather than single values. And that's gonna speed it up a lot. Um, or we could take the loop Right and do it in C plus plus. So that's the comparison we're going to do here. The um, that's the point of this little exercise. Okay, we have our version just done 
the way you know I might do it <laughs> with a loop because I have trouble vectorizing things sometimes. Uh, or you could vectorize it. And the main thing to do the vectorization is just using Pmax and if else instead of using this kind of if and else thing, right? Um, so that it works on vectors. And then finally, we could just, okay, I'll just translate the R code directly into C++ and run it full speed on the metal and see what happens. So it generates some uh, fake data. And the question is, who's faster here? <laughs> oh, I forgot which one's which now. So number one is R code with a loop. Number two is vectorized R code. Number three is C++, okay. So we can see that the C code is faster. First of all, it's lightning fast compared to the base R loop, but no, but that's no surprise. But it's also faster even compared to the vectorized version. Again, this is probably due to the R version having to be more generic and consider special cases, whereas we are not considering any special cases. Anything that's not exactly the exactly the types we want them to be is going to crash the <laughs> crash the system, right? So that's a that's another application where you know that factor this factor of uh, you know, two might matter, right? For some things you're doing. Usually won't though, I don't think. Okay, so um, that's basically what the, 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 the lightning fast, uh, as <laughs> fast as I executed this, uh, present, this presentation in C++, no, it's a <laughs> slide per second. Um, <laughs> There's some resources here. Uh, there is this uh, website, the official website of the, oh, there's something. No, sorry. Is that a long time ago? I went digging into what defines mean, ah. in the R source. And it looks like the second pass only happens if the result of the first pass is finite. Otherwise, okay. it won't bother doing a second one, but. Okay. Was interesting yeah so this uh is the official website for rcpp there's not really a lot on there unfortunately it mainly points to this guy's book seamless r and c plus plus in it which is a hundred dollar book or something i'm probably i mean it's a spring of burlock book you know those things are never cheap um, <laughs> uh the documentation inside r is is really good though the vignettes that are inside there are, are really good for 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 how to do things in rcpp for C++ itself, uh, people often recommend the C++ tutorial um, called learncpp.com, I think. I never really liked it myself. It's like bombards you with ads. You get a better, better have an ad blocker on there. And uh, yeah, it's, and I'm not sure that's pedagogically the best uh, for people, especially people like you that already know how to program in at least one other language. Uh, I don't know if that's the best source. In fact, I think this source, Right here, our C++ 20 for programmers, the Deedle and Deedle people do, is a really good book for people that already know how to program in some language and want to learn how to use modern C++. Um, I like that book. I use it myself as a refresher uh, a couple of years ago when I was about to write some a lot of C++. I didn't do the whole book, but um, I did use it for a refresher. Uh, also, I, I kind of skipped over, of course, the, the, the greatest resource for referencing uh, for stuff for C++ is this C++ reference, um, the, which I linked to you before, but this is the link, but yeah. In fact, I wonder if I can. No, oh, never mind. Anyway, that's, uh, that's it, man. We man. did it. <laughs> <laughs> Shake up a martini. Now, I, does, <laughs> does anyone have any questions? I kind of went through that sort of fast because, I mean, um, you could spend weeks talking about C++ and R and, and really not do a very good job. But I think the key takeaway here is you have the ability, if you get stuck where you're like, okay, this is still taking too long. Um, I can't figure out how to vectorize this loop or I need to get at some code that's only available from C++, like a special library, then this is your go-to way to do, because RCPP makes it much easier than using the, the standard R um, API that they have for interfacing with native C. It makes it much easier. You may say, well, this doesn't look easy at all, but it's much easier than what it could be. 
And for some straightforward numerical calculations, it is pretty straightforward. You just have to make sure you're careful about the types and you know you can find some examples online and, and go from there. But it's a tool. It's a tool. This is the last chapter of advanced art. So it's a tool that obviously that is something to be aware of at least. And if you have to use it, you'll now know that there's an RCPP thing to help you out. Yeah. Okay. Has anyone ever ever I had think to I'll be that? getting into RC, uh, RCPP anytime soon, but it is cool <laughs> for sure. I just like the fact that it's so easy to like if you do know C++, this is just fantastic because you can <laughs> you can you can so quickly pro I mean I'm tempted to like when I'm working on a C++ code to just prototype it like within RCPP, even though I don't need it with the R part, just because it's so easy to like to to get at things and interact with it, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the the source the source CPP was that function is really nice because even just for catching syntax errors, like it was like great because like you know I would retype some of it to kind of get used to the language a little bit, and then if I miss like a semicolon, the interface would just like straight up be like, hey, you're missing a semicolon on this line, and you can go and fix it. And it just yeah. it was I think it's I think it's awesome. I don't know C plus plus, but if I ever had to, I feel a lot more comfortable with it as a tool so yeah i wonder if they was working like r rust or something like that because i know rust is like the hot kid on the block right now and there is one i don't know how well developed it is but it does exist for rust oh. you know, Rust. Oh. But of course there's four yeah. but gross did you say there's four <laughs> well yeah because S and a little bit of R is written oh, yeah. in Fortran, so like you can. Was it F77? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but I looked into it very briefly once and then was like, yeah, may, maybe not. But I've had to work with Fortran. I mean, I worked with Fortran, I was already considered way out of date, but it was like my advisor had this old Fortran 77 code. code. If you ever programmed old Fortran, that's it was uh, originally indexed, you know, it was originally punch cards. So you had to like put things in particular columns, you know, it's like in the source code, it's so bad. I think Fortran 90 did away with that, but yeah, Fortran, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Well, well uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Well, I was just, I was just gonna kind of wrap up um, and just say thank you to everybody for participating within the group, I mean, this has been uh, one of the groups that I feel that I, has pushed me, has one, pushed me a lot, uh, but I do feel like I am a, a better R programmer now. At least I understand more of it now. And it is quite amazing to know that we started on October 24th of last year, and now we're already at June, or June 12th of 2023. So it is it's one, just a good evidence of the dedication that this group has had to finish this book. And then second, it's also a good sign of the, of the, of the power of this community for people to join in and share. Um, and so I'm just very thankful for this community. I'm very thankful for all, for all of you for joining in. And yeah, I'm just thankful for everybody sharing their insights with me. And I appreciate it every, every chance we got to meet. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for facilitating. Yeah, for sure, Colin. Yeah, it's, uh, it was definitely overwhelming, but like I definitely have like a whole bunch of things I want to go back over and like, you know, it's like this stuff, you know, obviously you got to go over it again and again, you know what I mean? I think that's, that was one of the things that got really frustrating at first. I was like, you know, if I couldn't figure out how to like use this right away, it, it, it's really easy just to be like, well, screw it, you know, why bother? But, but I think, yeah, like repeated effort and repeated sort of understanding and readings is I think is key. These book clubs are great because there's, first of all, they kind of force you in some way to actually finish the whole book. I don't know how many times I like started a book. I'm like, I'm going to oh, go yeah. all the way through this PyTorch book or whatever it is. And then get like, you know, three, four chapters in, like lose interest and go off and do something else. So and yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad for that because I, you know, I like to be able to, you know, complete the whole book and, and get to the last parts and learn kind of some of the more advanced things. Not that I'm going to necessarily use them, but at least I will know about them. And right. Yeah. You need to use them. I know where to look. Right? 
Yeah, I mean, even if you, uh, that's a good point. Like, even if you never do RCPP, you, at least you have an understanding of what it's doing, you know? Like, maybe that's like a bridge too far and you're like, it, it may be a bridge too far in my, like, coding experience, but it, just understanding it is pretty key, I think. Yeah, someday you'll yeah. be running code. You'll be like, damn, this is taking, like, all afternoon. And... <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, or or you'll just or you'll just you'll just remember it and you're like I remember doing this one thing in metaprogramming which oddly enough happened to me earlier last week I was like oh. I remember this somewhere and so and I made it work I got it to work I didn't nice. really understand it but I, I got it to work <laughs> which was nice so um, but then I had a better understanding of what I was doing so instead of just like throwing on quo quo and expression and expression at it trying to get it to work I actually kind of understood it at, to somewhat of a level but um maybe proficient at it so and like i said yeah like you said it, it's a it's a benefit too because i don't know how many false starts i've had with this book uh, i think i've tried reading it three or four times and i always got to like maybe like chapter three or four and i was like uh this is just too much but yeah, yeah. the 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 book club groups are awesome because it really forces you to dedicate yourself to actually finishing the book so yeah absolutely Your um, pressure works but yeah, peer pressure definitely does work. I do want to have one more announcement here, though. Um, John the Geek, I think, is going to facilitate uh, Hadley joining us on, what is it? Is it June 30th or was that the right date? Let me get this June right. 30th? Uh, yep, June 30th. Yep. What was it? Like noon, I think? Noon Eastern? Maybe? Uh, be he has 11, 11 a.m. CDT. Yeah. yeah, it's 11 a.m. Central Time. A formal announcement coming soon. So mark your calendars. I, I know John is is intending to fold in some other book clubs, obviously, because um, Hadley's time is very valuable. And so he's going to fold in some other groups. But um, I definitely encourage anybody here to join in. Anybody who's been following us on YouTube and hasn't joined in, in the group, if you want to join in, that would be a great opportunity too. Um, but yeah, yeah, June 30th. At 11 a.m. CDT, Hadley will join in um, to answer any questions that people might have. So. Man, if someone's been following us this whole time, I really want to apologize. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 I'm yep. so sorry that you had to watch all this. So, but hey, that's not, such is life. <laughs> hey, I've seen some thumbs up. I've seen some thumbs up hey, on some of our um, videos. So, no, oh, hey, maybe I mean I'm. He could have stopped I mean, anytime. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you, you don't have to watch it. You know, no, so. <laughs> no. there's plenty of other things on in YouTube land to watch. So. <laughs> All right, fellas. Hey, I will. Uh, maybe I'll run into you guys in another club down the road. I'm going to take a little break. Yeah, uh, I, I got so much work to do. Um, but yeah, maybe in six months I'll be, I'll be ready for another book. Yeah, for sure. Peace. See you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Good rest of your time. See ya. See ya. See ya.